Kim's right. I, 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 this talk was actually starting to turn into the sub, it was going to have the headline, but that's a subject for another TED talk. <laughs> There's so many things in this. So, and I, I may cross the line and uh, break the cardinal rule of TED talks where you're only just supposed to share one idea. But um, here goes. I think we would all agree that our world needs heroes like never before. From housing to continental problems to global uh, pollution problems, 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 and heroes solve problems. I am a cross between a filmmaker and a screenwriter and a political and social campaigner. And I've studied the nature of what makes heroes heroic and what makes villains villainous. And it really comes down when you strip it away to, to two things. That fundamentally, heroes are selfless and villains are selfish. In their motives, in what they're trying to do, the greatest hero ultimately puts somebody else's needs above their own, even to the point where they'll lay down their own life. A villain will do the opposite. They will pursue only their own agenda, only their own goal. They'll kill their henchmen. They'll even ditch the girlfriend. They do seem strangely uh, attached to their pets, though. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the great hero will pursue helping somebody else. So it's fundamentally that line between selfishness and selflessness. Or well, let me put this another way. My first slide. Let's see if it works. Heroes solve other people's problems. And villains solve their own. Now, in reality, don't worry, because all of us are a bit of both. In reality, few of us are one extreme or the other. We all slosh around in the middle. But that led me into another thought. When we are paid money, whether it's in a job or as a freelancer or a favoured somebody, when we get paid money, it's because we have solved a problem for somebody else. Fundamentally, when it comes right down to it, that's it. And if you've been paid money without solving a problem for somebody else, well, that's either a crime usually, <laughs> or it means that you're on borrowed time because it's only a matter of time before somebody discovers you. There are some areas in the arts particularly where you think you're not solving a problem, but when you get, we could have another conversation about that because um, anyway, that is a TED talk for another time. So, Here's the problem. I mean, Wales is where we live right now. Um, this is a nation in poverty. The poverty scales are enormous. They're well hidden. Um, but this is just, I mean, there are global problems to tackle, but Wales in here, the one that catches my attention most often is, is the, the scale of the, the economic problems. Wales runs at a deficit of between uh, roughly 14 billion pounds a year, which is money that Westminster, our central government, has to give Wales. Um, now, I started to think, what would it be if we, if we started to see wealth creation as something other than just digging up minerals out of the ground? What if it turns out that we have wealth hidden inside every single person, untapped wealth, in every child, unlimited potential, Imagine um, if you were to take Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you, know, you think of all these characters and add all their wealth together. What if you had a nation full of people like that? What is the secret to creating those people? These are... Back to this hero's idea for a moment. The thing with heroes is that heroes are born out of pursuing a mighty quest, not because they're following a curriculum. Let me say that again. Heroes are born out of mighty quests, not because they're following a curriculum. Now, I started questioning the education system a number of years ago, and I arrived at a number of conclusions that I thought to myself, these are bonkers, nobody's ever gonna believe me, so I kept them to myself. And then I came across uh, Ken Robinson, I was like, he stole all my ideas. So Ken, thank you for laying the groundwork. 
since then, I've come across all kinds of other people and discovered this is a global conversation about an education revolution that is not just nice to have, but absolutely critical in order to face the 21st century. Briefly, if you haven't come across Sir Ken, firstly, where have you been hiding? And secondly, he, he arrived, there's one central thought that he had that I want to come back to, which is that our education system as we have it, it was designed around the time of the Industrial Revolution, and it was based on the prevailing thinking at the time, which is that you take raw materials at one end, you cram them through an automated, mechanized process, and at the other end dro drops nicely identical products. And anything that isn't identical is either recycled until it does come out the way it's supposed to do, or it's discarded as a reject. And our education system was built on that model, and it was an upgrade compared to what we had before. But it was, um, it's not for the purpose anymore. It was before the internet, it was before YouTube, it was before social media. And it, it was great for a while, it did its purpose, it sort of did. But it's not organic, it's not natural. Children, I've got little girls and uh, you watch them, they, we are pre-programmed, we arrive into this world pre-programmed to be driven to learn by curiosity. Curiosity. When you start to push, you see this with children, it's the same with us as well, when you start to push a learning experience on somebody, you, you then come into direct conflict with another core human attribute, which is our free will. And we just resent it. Even if it's good for us, even if we know up here it's good for us, something deep down here says, but I didn't ask you for this, I didn't want this, you're pushing it on me. Coming back full circle. So Ken Robinson, a number of other great speakers kind of arrived at a number of conclusions about the, the, the real problems with our current education system. So the solution. Um, I'd like to talk about what I'm calling free dragon schools. It's a, a, um, there's an, lots of people have talked about a number of these ideas. So I'm going to put up on the board here just a few of the, hang on. It really does play. I've called it my school for heroes. How do you give a child a quest instead of a curriculum? So, um, by the way, there is a school. There are some schools in the United States called Sudbury schools. Sudbury schools. I thought I was mad enough to think of, that nobody would ever believe me. It turns out there are schools in the United States, probably elsewhere in the world, who are already doing this. So it's not like this is untested. It's not like it's unproven. Um, there's just an important element that I want to add into this. So there is no curriculum, no curriculum at all. No cur imagine if, imagine, that, imagine this for a moment. Imagine if we treated our high school exams and qualifications the same way we treat learning to drive. <coughs> you do it when you're ready, you do it at your own pace, and if you fail, you keep learning and going back again and again and again until you pass. And you can do that at any point in your life. Imagine if all of our, if we collected GCSEs or, or various qualifications throughout our life in that way. When we're ready for it, on our own terms, using YouTube to learn and watch about it, going to teachers to say, I've got some questions. Teachers, imagine being in an environment where you just waited until kids came to you and said, there's something I really want to know. And you spent all your time just helping them to learn things that they want to know. Anyway, so there'd be no curriculum in this, this dream school, and this is how they do it at Sudbury as well. Children choose their own quest. This is the bit that I'd like to add. Now, this is how I would do it in my dream school. Each, kid, each child would have their own desk. Their own desk that's theirs. It's theirs. It's their own space. Ownership. Personal responsibility is very, very important in all of this. And above their desk, there'd be very few requirements in this education system. Um, by the way, this is just a short list. There are a lot more things on this. They would have above their desk a board that says, my quest today is. And here's the thing. This is the, the important part of my talk today. Every day they would go in and they would choose to learn about somebody else's problem. Really important that it's somebody else's problem. It can be anything. And they would, learn for, they would learn about it for as long as they feel like learning about it, or for a short. It could be like five minutes, and they're bored with that. 
it could turn to half an hour, it could turn into 20 minutes. But do you know what will happen? Eventually, they'll get onto something that they go, that really interests me. And something resonates. Something resonates in here. And then they'll learn about it a bit more and a bit more. And do you know what the next thing that happens? Because we're humans, we start to think about solutions to those problems. And then the real magic happens. We decide, I'm going to have a go at that. I'm going to begin to try and tackle that problem. When you get a child to the point where they have reached that, a hero is born. A quest has begun. And from that point, as they, as they reach a new problem, they can go and learn about what they need to know. Maths, engineering, science, biology, chemistry, computer programming. As they start to solve that problem for somebody else. Now, I'd like to introduce you to somebody if you've never heard of this kid. Alex Knoll. Can you raise your hand if you know who he is? All right, you're in for a treat. Um, he, was, uh, he first came to my attention on, uh, on uh, his little kid from Idaho. This is him with Ellen. Um, with, um, and that's pretty, if, I'm, if that's not J.J. Abrams, I'm in trouble for getting my filmmakers wrong. And, uh, and of course, Tim Cook, Apple CEO. He's 14 now, I think. But I mean, age nine, okay? Age nine, this brilliant kid, Alex was out with his parents and he saw somebody in a wheelchair struggling to get into a sporting hardware <coughs> shop. Couldn't get up the stairs. And he thought to himself, I wonder if there's an app where disabled people can rate facilities so that other disabled people know whether they're any good or not. So he went home and he checked into it. It turned out the app didn't exist. So with a little help, he made it. It's called Ability App. I don't have a slide for it, but go, go Google it. Ability App. He created an app that helps to do that. By 12, I think he's 12 years old when he's appearing on Ellen, he'd got the thing ready to go to market. Since then, he's going on. Now, I want you to imagine. Imagine Alex, okay? Imagine at school, he, he finishes high school, and he never gets any qualifications but he successfully turns Ability App into a viable business product. Will anybody think of him as a failure because he screwed up his high school? No. Nobody sensible, at least. Because he's fundamentally already doing the thing that we all have to figure out how to do when we finally drop out the other end of the education system. We realize, ah, oh, so in order to get paid money, I have to solve problems for people. Eventually, that penny drops for us. So, here's the problem. I, I, I briefly back to my um, democratically run by the kids. This, I'm going back to my ideal education system here. Uh, this is how they do it in Sudbury schools. The kids make all the rules. It's run democratically. They, op they have their own, uh, they set the rules in the school. Uh, they're their own uh, governing body. If one of the kids breaks the rules, they have to go to, before a judge and jury of their own, the, their own, their, their own peer group. Um, zero government involvement other than fundamental, other than funding. This is the bit I want to just wrap up on because here's the how to do it. For all of the conversations that are going on globally about an education revolution, and there are some brilliant ones, and they're all coalescing. I'm, I'm noticing the pattern. They're all turning into, the, they're all heading in the same direction. It's not as though everybody's talking about l wildly different conflicting ideas. You're discovering people are coming to the same conclusions. So why are our schools not, that, not like that? So Ken's talk was like a decade ago. How is it that we're not, how, you know, we all were like, yeah, let's do it. Why are we not have, doing that now? This is where my politician and political activist side comes into it. Now, I'm not here to extol the virtues of, of either left-wing or right-wing politics or any one political party. But the problem here in Britain, certainly, and probably in other countries around the world, is that fundamentally, the key holders, the, gate, the, the gatekeepers and the key holders, are politicians. And badly informed politicians with their own questionable agendas is a, is a recipe for trouble. Politicians, by their very nature, across the political spectrum, I, I work in politics, and I see this across the political spectrum, is that they're, 
Politicians are drawn to the authoritarian nature of politics and the command and control model, the idea of them being in charge and the rest of us just have to do as we're told. That's what the school system, you know, so there is a final, <coughs> for any of these changes to be made, whether they're mine or anybody else coming up with brilliant ideas, there is a final line to cross, which is politicians need to get out of the way. Politicians need to let go. They need to be willing to surrender control of the education system so that it is strictly, thank you very much, so that it is strictly between the only two people that matter, a child and a teacher. Everybody else is in the way. Even well-meaning parents can overstep the mark and end up over-worrying and just fussing. The, ultimately, the, com the, the child is the customer. Now, the reason I'm saying this is that whatever your political persuasion, whatever your political views are, next time you get to talk to a politician, next time one of you comes to um, ask you for their vote, say to them, would you be willing to relinquish control of the education system, yes or no? And for those occasional few who say, I'd do that, give them your vote. Thank you very much. <laughs>